Okay, well, the clock's ticked around to 11 o'clock, so let's get going. So good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm James Walsh, Head of Membership Engagement at the PLSA, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to this PLSA webinar on ESG and climate risk insights. Uh, this event forms part of our education partnership with CASIS, and we're very pleased to have their support for this area of our activities. If you're not already familiar with CASIS and the many services they provide pension schemes that ensure their UK Managing Director, Pat Sharman, uh, who's joining us today, will explain that very briefly uh, in a moment. So here's how we're going to run things this morning. Pat Sharman is going to talk us through the results of a survey that my PLSA colleagues and CASIS have been running to dig into attitudes to ESG and climate change issues among uh, fellow PLSA members. Uh, and after uh, Pat's presentation, we'll have a discussion in more detail about those issues with a panel that are all geared up to answer your questions as well as mine. So do put your questions in the uh, Q&A box in the usual way. And if you've got comments, those are welcome too, but put those in the chat box, please. So we've got three people who will be on the panel uh, and they're Ajit Mandraker. Uh, Ajit is co-head of River and Mercantile Solutions. And his key focus is on helping trustees to achieve their funding objectives. I can see we've got a nice uh, description of, uh, of our panelists there on the screen for you. We've also got my former colleague, Caroline Escott, who used to work with us at the PLSA until just a few weeks ago. Nice to see you again, Caroline. Uh, and Caroline recently left us for Pastures New at RPMI Railpen, and she's senior investment manager there, leading their global corporate governance activities. And then we've got Scott Foster completing the panel. Scott is product specialist at Cassis and he oversees their sustainable governance, governance services for schemes, including cost transparency and ESG look through, all very important issues. So welcome, uh, panel. Very nice to have you all with me this morning. Uh, and we're going to kick off with Pat talking us through our recent survey. So Pat, good morning and over good to morning. you. Good morning. Thank you, James, for that wonderful introduction. And good morning, everybody. Um, welcome to our webinar. Um, so I'm Pat, I work for Cassis, and we specialise in providing governance solutions for pension schemes. But I want to get straight into the survey results today. So next slide, please. So as James alluded to, we carried out um, a survey in partnership with the PLSA this summer. And what we did is we got 93 responses, so great response, and from a real wide range of pension schemes, DB, DC, Master Trust and LGPS. And also a really nice broad range of size of scheme, as you can see on the slide. So I think we've got some really interesting results. There are some small differences between the small and the large schemes, but I will point those out as we go along. So let's crack on and get into the first set of results. Next slide, please. So one of the first questions we asked in our survey, what are the main reasons for driving increasing exposures to ESG? So I think the real positive result here is that 49% of schemes recognise that responsible investing has the potential for better member outcomes. The biggest change, or the biggest, one of the biggest drivers for change that we often see is driven by the regulators and or the investor demand. So I think the fact that 45% saw new legislation as a key driver and 29% saw pressure for members as key driver were not unexpected. There's also growing evidence that companies who have sustainable models or sustainable businesses will outperform those that don't. So the 43% who saw performance reasons as key driver as a keys driver, were also not really a surprise. When we asked the survey respondents who they thought would be responsible for ESG or responsible investing, but 75% said that it lay with the pension scheme board. However, what we'll see on the next slide is there's still an over-reliance on asset managers and consultants. Next slide, please. So what we now see is there a, there's a gap between the results on the first slide and this slide. 
So just to recap, 49% of respondents said a key driver for improving responsible investing was to improve or potentially improve member outcomes. And 75% said it was the responsibility of the pension fund board. I'm going to talk about pooled fund reporting, or pooled fund voting, sorry. This is something that's been much debated within the industry. I'm making the assumption that a lot of you will be aware of the initiative by the AMNT and the Red Lines guidelines to help pension schemes actually implement and develop their own voting policy. And just to touch on a review that the AMNT did last year in May on the voting policies of asset managers, they reviewed 42 voting policies of asset managers. And some of the results were astonishing. For example, 53% of those voting policies didn't mention climate change. Astonishing. However, on this result, we see that 58% respondents said that they prefer their asset managers to take a lead in voting decisions for pooled funds. Only 16.5% actually want to implement their own voting policy. You may have also seen that there was an announcement from the pensions minister last week that he's agreed the formation of a working group proposed by the AMNT and led by the DWP to look at solutions for improving stewardship and specifically improved funds. So more to come on this one. Again, when we look at the previous slide and 75% has said that they believe the board is responsible for responsible investing, bit of a mouthful that one. Um, but actually when we look at this slide, 52% are still relying on information from their asset managers to assess the ESG component in the pension scheme. And 51% use their consultant. 62% ask their consultant to actually help them with the climate change and ESG risk for the new SIP rules. And only 17% have a dedicated individual ESG team, and only 21% independently verify if their asset managers are actually integrating ESG factors. I will go back and say the 17% and the 21% were mainly big schemes and therefore had the resource to actually implement their own ESG teams. The last result is not a surprise. What the, the positive on this slide is, the 43% are having dialogue with other trustees. And I think that's really, really important here that we share knowledge and we work together on these very important matters. Next slide, please. So when we talk about climate risks, I think we can all agree that the majority of, it, the majority of schemes are still in a very early stage of understanding climate change risks. 63% said they did not have enough information to help them translate climate change risks into their investments. That's a huge number. But I, what I think is even more telling is the next result. 71%, 71% of respondents said that they thought that climate change risks would either have a low or a medium impact on the scheme's investments. Now, I don't need to tell all of you that the, tw the, the, most, the 20 warmest years have happened in the last 22 years. And the Arctic sea ice has reduced by 40% in the last 40 years. We need to better understand these risks to the pension schemes. We need to develop our understanding. Trustees need to look at the risks, which are typically put into two categories physical and transition. A good example of physical risk is the Australian bushfires in 2019 and this year. A recent report has actually identified that it's human caused climate change that's actually caused these fires. A good example or an example of a transition risk is the move or to a low economy carbon 
a low, uh, sorry, low carbon economy. And the cost that that gives you or to, from a new regulation and investment perspective is a risk. And this will obviously create opportunities for some sectors, but also some risks for some sectors. And trustees need to understand this. Next slide, please. So the key gaps for pension schemes in supporting them to become responsible investors are two in a nutshell, education and data. 70% of respondents said they required a better understanding of how their asset managers implement ESG. 50% said that they want industry recognized training. We hope sessions like this will go some way to helping this. And James is also gonna to touch on at the very end as to what the PLSA are doing to support this initiative. But there's a massive lack of data. And I think this is even more of a challenge. 74% said they need access to data in order to manage the climate change risk in the schemes. 70% said they require information from their asset managers to understand how they're addressing climate change risk. 48% need more clarity on what data. And then in the middle of that, we have a lack of consistency across the industry. So I know there's a lot of initiatives taking, across, taking place across the globe. For example, the IFRS are creating a sustainability board. The pensions bill, which is likely to come into play next week and the subsequent regulation will actually obligate some UK pension schemes to report under the TCFD framework. So we're moving in the right direction, but a lot more work to be done. Next slide, please. So what can we do? I think pension schemes can explore the new tools that are becoming available to them. This will provide them with an independent oversight on the ESG and climate change risks. I think they need to widen the net and consider all the potential service providers. Only 2% considered using the custodian to help them assess ESG risks. The custodian or custodians generally have access to more data on the scheme's investment than any other service provider. So like I said, there are many new tools available to pension schemes and I encourage pension schemes to explore these. To conclude, overall the survey gives us comfort that we're on the right path. The pension schemes can play a big part in changing ESG and climate change risks and what a unique and exciting place this puts us in. Thank you. Uh, Pat, thanks very much. Fascinating uh, stuff there. Uh, and I know you're not uh, officially on our discussion panel, Pat, but I believe you're going to sort of hang around in the background, standing by, ready to uh, uh, answer any of the most difficult questions uh, when, when they come up. So uh, so we'll, we'll, we'll pull you in if we need to. Uh, in fact, yeah, I thought you gave us a really strong set of messages, very sort of clear messages, uh, particularly about those gaps, you know, the things that trustees really need, which is, which is more education and, and more data. Uh, and you're right, the PLSA is, is trying to do its bit to, to plug some of those gaps, at least. Uh, I mean, uh, I'm just thinking about our uh, Made Simple guide we published, um, I think, a year ago or so on um, uh, ESG Made Simple. It's a very useful piece of work for trustee, trustees, new trustees or uh, uh, staff, uh, pension team staff members. So I'll, I'll put a link to that in the uh, in the chat box if I can master the technology. Uh, but let's let's you know, get on to the panel discussion. Ladies and gentlemen, we've got 90 odd of you uh, um, uh, participating, which is fantastic. Do send your questions in. You can type them uh, in the in the Q&A box. But while you're just thinking of those, let's get our, our panel going. I can see them all uh, uh, um, uh, getting their cameras uh, in gear there, uh, Caroline and Scott uh, and Ajit. Uh, so um, I'd like to get their sort of initial reactions to what Pat, Pat's been saying. Caroline, perhaps I can start start with you. What jumped out at you uh, from Pat's presentation and, and how did it tie in with, with what good governance means to you? Mm -hmm. Thank you, James. Um, 
So there's one thing that jumped out at me here and then one thing that I want to, um, to flag that I thought that was interesting in the report um, of which I very kindly had a uh, prior sight of, which will hopefully whet everyone else's appetites for, um, for reading at some stage. So it will serve that purpose. So I think, um, you know, I, I would, uh, you know, none of the stuff that um, Pat said felt, um, felt off in terms of what we've been hearing when I was at the PLSA or, or what I hear from, from other people when I have discussions around ESG and climate governance. I think I would also pick up the, the fact that only 43% are having conversations with other trustees about how they better integrate climate change risks and how they're good climate and ESG sort of stewards of their assets as surprising because um, there are lots of different ways in which to, to have that conversation. The PLSA held climate roundtables. And for me now working at a, uh, at a pension scheme, mostly at a large pension scheme, but still being able to pick up the phone and having conversations with other people who are facing the same kinds of challenges that we are, um, is, is absolutely one of the most valuable things in hearing where they have gone wrong and how we can learn from that and things that are going well for them and thinking about how we apply that to our own experience. Um, the other thing I wanted to raise in the report was that only 11 percent are having conversations about exclusions and Railpen um, as a pension scheme does believe in engagement over divestment, but we also have a sense that where we think a factor is particularly material and ESG issues particularly material, so for instance, and tar sands, oil sands, um, and where you think that there is something that's really going to be a stranded asset, at some stage, you need to start thinking about where you draw the line in terms of excluding it from your portfolio. So we also consider exclusions where the evidence base is really solid as an important part of our approach to, to ESG and stewardship generally. Um, but going to the second part of your question, James, so, so what good governance looks like um, to us? Um, and I should point out, I'm looking at this with two hats. So one is the RPMI Railpen hat. I'm also a trustee for the Standard Life Master Trust, and I'm delegated liaison for ESG and stewardship issues there. And I think it comes back to the learnings for any kind of good governance setup, which is that it's all about the right people with the right experience and understanding, the right TKU, supported by effective systems and processes. So I think it is incumbent on, on you know, the trustees to either holistically have a solid understanding of the ESG developments. Now, I recognise that that's very difficult because it's constantly changing. And it was interesting seeing the findings from the survey on the regulatory drivers behind that as well. And we still haven't come to an agreement around using consistent language when you talk about ESG or climate or stewardship or responsible or sustainable investment. Um, but, you know, I ensure that you have a trustee board that has someone with that kind of expertise or that you are using your external advice um, or your advisors or your custodians and you are making sure that you're picking them in part because you you recognize that they have that expertise in ESG and stewardship that you lack and then for the rest of it thinking about the systems and processes um, really making sure that you have got a, a concrete sense of what your beliefs on ESG and stewardship are as a trustee or so having those conversations which occasionally be quite challenging but making sure that you achieve an agreement on an appropriate level um, and then weaving that through your statement of investment principles and actually really importantly documenting it along the way the conversations you're having and the decisions you're making not only is it just a good part of any robust investment governance framework but when it comes to things like the implementation statement disclosures and the tcfd disclosures that are coming down the track being able to demonstrate that paper trail and what you have done and where it's made an impact will make life much easier when it comes to producing really robust disclosures that stand the test of the regulator and campaign groups and of course most importantly your beneficiaries yeah. Thanks, Karen. Yeah, so, so you, I think you've given a great guide to what good governance is in general, not just in regard to ESG. Thanks, uh, Ajit. What 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 really struck you from from the survey, uh, and 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 have you got any comments on how it links to to good governance in general? Yeah, no. Th thanks, and uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, ni nice to uh, see you all virtually um, uh, in, in this environment. I mean, I I think. Uh, I'd start from the perspective, your second point in a sense, in terms of where do we see the sort of direction of travel and what good governance and effective governance looks like. Um, so I, I sort of certainly welcome the, the work that you, you and Cassis have been doing together 
because it raises awareness first and foremost. I, I think that's that's certainly the the while we've all been aware of the the nature of certain ESG risks, the nature of climate risk, etc. But how does it actually manifest in itself in a call to action? And it's th surveys like this that raise the awareness and I think raise the dialogue, which is that Caroline touched on as well earlier, not just between trustees, but actually as a need as an industry as a whole for us to collaborate more. Uh, for us to work out solutions that aren't just candidly cater for the needs of our largest uh, institutional investors out there, but actually cater for the broader populace as well. You just look at the PLSA membership or the wider and the range of schemes out there. Uh, I think one of the interesting aspects and it's very useful insight is that probably about 60% of the, the, those polled represent schemes with assets over a billion, billion pounds. Um, but if we look at the population and the demographic of schemes across the market today, clearly there's a significant number uh, below that level. So how can we be working to learn from what we can do with larger schemes like Caroline's and, and others out there, but also in terms of making that packaged and scalable as well? Yeah. Um, but to me, there's, there's probably three things that I, I, I'm certainly looking at with, with my hat on, and that comes from an investment consultant and fiduciary management perspective. So really working with boards of trustees uh, to help them address, think about where they are today, and importantly, where do they go forward from here? And the, the first is around transparency and accountability. Uh, I think uh, we need we need concrete, consistent data and information as one of the many inputs into evolving our dialogue and not, not only understand where we are today, but where we're trying to get to go to going forward from here. Uh, and again, I think one, one of the things that has been great over the last last few years, and in a sense, now we're all, all in a virtual environment, it's kind of forced us to be more upfront in terms of collating data and presenting that data in a much more efficient and digestible way, uh, which really helps people understand where they are. I think, I think the second thing is we all need to be forward looking. Uh, it's kind of an obvious point to make. Uh, but again, take, moving on from the data point, the data kind of gives us an idea of where we are and where we've come from. But the, the key point to me is you are where you are. The question is, where do we go forward from here? What are the steps we're going to make to keep ourselves on the right trajectory going forward and very much use this time as a, as almost as a call to action? And that's around driving positive change that makes us making incremental steps, not just at the larger end of the market, but more broadly, that really move the ESG, how we're addressing ESG and climate risk on the agenda and how, how it serves as a call to action to make ch incremental changes from here. Yeah, thanks, Edgy. Uh, I'm going to come to Scott in, in, in just a moment, but actually, I just want to come back to you because it's very interesting what you said about the, the, the particular challenge for smaller schemes and you're right, we've got a lot of members at the PLSA that are but a, 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 the smaller end of the pension scheme spectrum. Um, and we've already had a question on, on this from Sarah Keefley coming in. She says, uh, isn't uh, exclusion, you know, excluding certain investments, only possible for the larger schemes? Uh, because smaller schemes are investing in pool funds and will have very limited power to exclude investment in, say, tar sands. Any comments on that? It, I think it's a good question. Uh, it, it really does, it does highlight one of the, let's call it, perceived challenges, I'd almost call it, in terms of how we're set up today. You're absolutely right. If you have a segregated portfolio, you're a large scheme, you've got far more control to very much direct um, what you want to have in, have out, and how you engage and influence positive change from there. Uh, I think I still go back to my earlier point around the need for better collaboration and better flexibility um, in terms of how we put products together, how we how we essentially take on board what clients' expectations are and their beliefs to really make sure the new products that are coming through have some of that flexibility built in that you can, where, whether it's sort of direct voting or what have you, it, within a pool fund construct, again, the technology is evolving and developing to, to very much separate out voting rights, et cetera, but it's still some way to go. Um, I think the other factor, we have to bear this in mind, is in terms of when we think about uh, institutional pension schemes, at the end of the day, they've got a crucial role today, whether they're big or small. Hmm. They are long-term investors. Typically that time frame is shrinking for DB, but for DC, it's clearly growing the other way. But again, as a, as, a, as a capital owner, there's a significant amount of assets invested in this space today. And again, that needs to be channeled in the right way as we go forward from here. Now, one of, my, one of the debates we often have internally is around that notion about exclusion or inclusion, 
how do we think about that or otherwise? And, and one way of looking at this is very much, we think about it in the context of um, as an asset owner or capital owner or directing asset ownership, there is the aspect of where you want, where you want to see the direction of travel is the cost of capital for, court, for really good companies um, that, that are very much aligned to progression from the ESG and climbers. That cost of capital is progressively coming down. And that arguably comes down by the weight of interest and appetite for it for institutions to invest in those. And conversely, um, those that aren't embracing some of these factors, in principle, their cost of capital should be going up over time. And again, that, that is that influence to, to, to drive positive change. Because again, if their cost of capital comes down, that puts them on a, on a more positive trajectory, not just from an ESG and climate perspective, but also from a financial performance perspective. So I think it, it's that notion, whether big or small, it needs us to collaborate together, uh, particularly working with the investment management community to ensure some of that thinking is very much playing through, because that ultimately is driving shareholder value, which implicitly drives growth in pension scheme assets and therefore security to members. Yeah, thanks, Sanji. Great. Well, let's, let's bring in Scott from, from Cassi. Scott, good morning to, to, to you. Uh, obviously, you, you, you've, you've helped to work with... Uh, Pat and us on the on the survey. What do you think of most significant findings uh, from from the survey, and how does it key in with your view of what good ESG governance is? Yeah. Hi. Thanks, and um, good morning, everyone. It's good to be here. And so, yeah, just some initial thoughts on the results, um, and just to echo maybe some of um, Ajit's comments on that data. I think what was really striking to me is that you know seventy four percent of respondents say they need more access to data on climate change risks. And 48% report they need more clarity on um, what data is actually available on climate change risks as well. And we sort of see that those statistics as barriers to action um, on ESG and climate change. And I think making that data more accessible and more affordable, uh, particular, particularly to smaller schemes who potentially don't have the scale to access that research and that data uh, as freely as, as larger schemes is a challenge that we need to come up with a solution for. Um, and so the lack of information or not knowing what's out there are, are potentially um, barriers to change um, and implement, implementing ESG and climate change risk more um, in, embedded within the pension schemes overall investment strategy. And I think another key point that, I, that, that came out to me in some of the results was uh, the point around standardization um, and the lack thereof. It. And I think you know, there are quite a few industry frameworks, the UNPRI publish a lot of mm. good um, resource on that, um, as well as that with coming TCFD requirements, there's more and more um, information and frameworks that are available out there to start to dissect and, and properly report on this um, information. And there are uh, recommendations on, on norms and, and principles such as the UN Global Compact that schemes can start to begin to align themselves to that cover issues such as human rights, labor rights, the environment, and uh, corporate governance as well. And I think that type of screening can be a good start uh, for schemes who, who aren't so sure uh, where to begin on all of this, because it is such a, such a big topic and it, it is such a big area and there's so many angles. Um, in terms of what good governance means to me, um, it's, it's a pretty basic one. Schemes should have a better understanding, a more transparent understanding of their underlying investments uh, from, a, from a look through basis, both for their segregated mandates and as well as that for their, for their pooled funds as well. And we hope that that independent data to those independent reports can start to give asset owners a better platform to govern their assets, govern their asset managers, and underst better understand how risks are identified, risks are managed, um, how controversies are identified and flagged, what, carbon foot, what the carbon footprint of the portfolio is, um, and if any exclusions are being taken into account. And that's all in line with what the scheme-specific investment principles are, and I think that's what it all boils down to. Yeah, good comment. Thanks, Scott. I mean, one thing you mentioned there, Scott, was about the, 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 the many or the increasing number of frameworks we've got for reporting and considering on these, these issues. And I hear quite a bit from our members as I sort of go around talking to them who say, look, we're a bit mesmerized by all this stuff. We've got TCFD, we've got UNPRI, there's all sorts of other, you know, there's, there's the, the, the government's own legislative requirements. You know, so where do we start? Do you think there's a risk that 
that that we've got sort of too too many uh, sets of guidance and regulation now, and it on some of these boiling down into one set. Yeah, I think it can be a risk that there's potentially too many frameworks out there and so many things that a scheme could potentially align itself to. But I would stick to you know the key recommendations from organisations like like the UNPRI. Um, frameworks that schemes need to adhere to from a regulatory perspective as well uh, to make sure they're, they're, they're ticking that box. Um, but it all, like I said, it all boils down to what the schemes, um, investment principles and beliefs are uh, on all these issues. And, yeah. and I think all these frameworks are, are out there, but it, it really sort of tests the scheme and um, what they actually believe and what they want to implement in, in terms of their investments. Yeah. And so, yeah, there's a lot out there, but try to keep it simple. Thanks. And of course, our, our Made Simple guide that we've done from PLSA, I put the link to it in the chat box. Uh, that may be of, of help. But I think Caroline uh, will have views on, on this issue of multiple frameworks. Caroline. Yes, I will do so. Um, the first thing is that when I was at the PLSA, yes, um, I was also hearing that from all of our members. And now that I'm in-house at a large pension scheme yep. with a dedicated in-house resource on sustainable ownership, ESG integration and active ownership. Um, it's one of the things that sort of we're very conscious of. And if you were to ask me what keeps us awake at night, nothing at the moment, sleeping like a lock during lockdown, luckily, but that is probably the closest thing to it in terms of these different disclosures, different, um, different frameworks, there's the stewardship code, there's the PRI report, and there's TCFD coming down the track, there's the implementation statement there's all this stuff and even though we feel like we do a good job on the content and Railpen has had this long history of working on corporate governance and the E and the S issues as well, I worry that we won't have sufficient resource, even us, to really do justice to the work that we do and the content and the thought that we put into it and the trustee board puts into it. So one of the things that um, Railpen is doing with, with a couple of other pension schemes actually is just trying to look at whether there is a way to um, produce disclosures that are um, uh, meet the requirements of these different reporting frameworks, some of which are voluntary, some of which are mandatory, because we're also very conscious of the fact that these disclosures are a fantastic opportunity actually to, to tell a compelling story to beneficiaries, to the regulators as well and other stakeholders about the work it is that we and many other pension schemes are doing. But we also worry a little about so many disclosures, is that going to put members off? How do we make sure that we achieve the right balance between putting the detail in there hitting the regulatory reporting requirements and also making it interesting and accessible for people. We have a standalone sustainable ownership report. We have done now for some time. We've actually been reporting using the TCFD framework for the last couple of years and we will be building that out in line with what we expect will be the statutory guidance from TPR and the, and the further regulations coming forward. Um, but we're really taking a step back and thinking, is there actually there are several different audiences for all this kind of stuff. How do we do it in the way that makes sense? Um, but, you know, we see this as an opportunity to tell the story, but we do, we do hope that we will do justice to the work that we do when we're telling the story and hit all the different things and all the different deadlines that we need to. Absolutely. Yeah. Sort of also, of course, isn't it? We've got all these different audiences to find the right message right kind of message for each one and because what I mentioned earlier our made simple guide we're also working I should say at the PLSA on a ESG summit um, a, probably a two-day event for, for next year where uh, we can't release the dates yet still uh, still finalizing the details but that's going to be a good opportunity for all our members to come together um, and, and consider these issues in just a little more more detail should be a good learning opportunity too so let's uh, have a look at some of the questions when we've got a few yes. questions coming in. Sorry, so I was just wondering if, if I could just add, add a comment just to, to sort of Caroline's reference to sort of on the previous aspects. I mean, the, the one one thing I would I, I would observe at the end of the day is um, while it's true there's been a, a sort of a continual sort of barrage of updated um, requirements, particularly on trustees in terms of their disclosure and reporting. At the end of the day, what has happened though is the the, the ESG and climate is, is front and centre of trustees' agenda now. Yeah, yes, it's onerous, so don't, don't get me wrong, but at the same time, where where to a degree so some of these factors have been, I wouldn't quite call it on the periphery, but at the same time, depending on your size of scheme and, and, and your nature of focus, 
um, where and while we may have been talking to clients about how they think about um, these risks within what they're doing, it is now very much front and center given their requirements of greater transparency and disclosure. Uh, and I think just in terms of our experience, I certainly echo Caroline's comments. I mean, I, I think where we're working, uh, if I put my sort of fiduciary hat on in that context, where I'm working with over 100, 100 institutional clients, we're effectively doing that for each of those clients day in, day out at the moment um, and supporting those clients around uh, particularly implementation statements, given those clients who didn't make the uh, uh, past the sort of report and accounts deadline uh, last month. But again, as we look towards um, from just obviously with, from a TS TCFD perspective, while a larger scheme perspective at the moment, clearly that is the direction of travel as a whole for everyone. So again, working, how do we help clients around that, provide them that data, that transparency, that narrative, and I think one of the things that I would sort of dwell on is very much, I'm very wary in this market where you have lots of requirements to disclose, you end up people ticking a load of boxes. Mm. Um, and, and for me, I think it, a lot of it hinges on the narrative that you put out there alongside the data that supports your disclosure. Yeah. So again, that aspect of working with clients to say, all right, let's assimilate your beliefs, let's understand at a scheme specific level, and a trustee governance level, how do you think about these things? But equally then helping them with the narrative that then, then helps them communicate uh, to all stakeholders in terms of what are they doing in practice? Uh, and again, doing that scheme by scheme, but it enabling to, to do that in a scalable way. And it goes back to my earlier point about balancing what a large scheme can do where they've got resource versus Bluntly, frankly, I'd say even for a large scheme, you've only got a finite level of resource for everything mm. else. So it is very much where we found as an industry from a consulting and fiduciary perspective that need to sort of build the resource so you can plug and play into every scheme to support their, their disclosure needs. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. And sorry, just to, just to clarify, yeah. yes, there are many disclosures, but we at Railpen strongly believe that a lot of it is to the good you know we've been doing responsible investment sustainable ownership now for many years this is why we have dedicated in-house resource and we're lucky that we can do that um you know it's possible to both think about how you hit the things that you need to on the disclosures but also think actually a lot of the work that's been done a lot of the regulation that's been done has been a really helpful nudge um and you know it's really positive that hopefully we'll start raising standards across the industry generally i'm sure that's right and can i could I just jump in as well? I know I'm not part of this panel, but sorry. Um, I just wanted to pick up the, the question around small schemes and sort of what G has, has said, and I'm in agreement, but I'm a trustee for a very small DC trust-based scheme. And we had exactly the same question. We invested in pool funds. What can we do? So we, we, we kept it simple because we knew that it'd be something that would evolve over time. And we just asked our you know, managers to comply with the UN PRI principles and the stewardship code and some really simple things. And then it came to implementation statement. And we, we thought, how can we actually, you know, understand truly what our asset managers are doing? They provide us with lovely, pretty reports. I say the drafts and koala bears on them, tell us a couple of great stories about how they've engaged with companies um, and positive outcome, et cetera, et cetera. But how do I actually know? Because they're going to tell me the good stuff, potentially not the bad stuff. So what we did, and again, I allude to the end of you know, my, my presentation, I was talking about there are some tools. There's some tools that are evolving out there that are cost effective for pension schemes. And I go back to Ajit's point, this is the starting point. We still need to think about the forward bit. But what we did is we screened. So we collected the data from our asset managers, looked through into the pooled funds at each individual asset, and we screened against the UN compact principles, the 10 UN compact principles for breaches. And I know this doesn't give us a complete story, but then with the breaches, we then went and discussed those breaches with the asset managers. What was their rationale for investing in those companies? How were they managing those risks? Could we see the engagement reports? How had they voted? You know, so I'm not saying it gave us the ability as a board of trustees to have a conversation. And this wasn't expensive to buy this data. So it was palatable for a small DC trust based scheme. The managers actually said we're probably the most detailed scheme to date, especially of our size, to come and challenge them. So I think it's evolving, but there are tools out there yeah. and smaller schemes can participate. It's not just about, you know, the great schemes like Caroline works for that have the resource. We can we can do something, we can play our part. So sorry, I just wanted to add that. 
No, that's fine. That's a very welcome comment, uh, Pat. And it's always great to hear, you know, the case studies as well. I love to, to hear that. Let's take some of the questions uh, that are coming in from the, our, our audience. Just one sort of admin question, first of all, from Gary Colclough, who's asking if a full results of the Cassi stroke PLSA survey available. And Gary, I think the, I'm pretty sure the answer is uh, yes, uh, we're very happy to circulate these afterwards. Also, the recording of this webinar uh, will be circulated uh, in the next few days to all uh, uh, attendees. Uh, Pat, any comment on publishing the survey results from you? No, we hope to do it over the next few days. I think the first point we're going to share with um, all attendees today on the webinar over the next okay. day or so. We'll definitely do that. Okay, good. So it's so, an interesting uh, read to read it. <laughs> yeah. Now we've got a couple of questions on the issue of uh, directing uh, investment. So Ian Neal says um, uh, that Pat rightly identified trustees over reliance on asset managers and consultants. To what extent, though, are trustees being frustrated uh, by the uh, FSMA 2000 ban on trustees directing investment and disinvestment in shares? And should this legislation be changed? to help trustees meet their obligations. And uh, Richard Robertson asked a sort of similar question saying, if trustees develop policy for asset managers to follow, is that quotes directing investment? So uh, Adji, perhaps would you have a comment on this? Yeah, no, I, th I think it's, it's a good question to raise. I mean, it, it's, a, it's a balance of, I, I kind of start when I talk about ESG and climate risk, I start with working through clients in terms of understanding their beliefs and their thinking, both in terms of where they are today and where they're trying to get to going forward from here. Uh, and then um, subject to their governance constraints, how engage, how much down, down to the level do they want to get involved in? Do they have the bandwidth to get involved in? Do they have the resource to get involved in? Uh, I think one of the positives that I would acknowledge uh, I think, uh, particularly in recent years, but it's particularly as we go forward from here, it is just far greater desire and effort to collaborate now to really take on board trustees' views, trustees' beliefs, the direction of travel by the wider investment management community, which which is very much enables um, schemes to, uh, to, to the other question as well, uh, enables schemes and trustees to influence their views on what the product is looking like and what, what's going on behind that. Um, but at the end of the day, when I look at the investment manager community, they have bolstered up and progressively also bolstering up the level of resource and level of focus on this space, which I think can only be a positive to actually move that direction forward. Um, and I think that will, that will serve to bring new products to market that really provide that flexibility. But within a governance framework that trustees, given all the other things that they have to address as well, to very much give them the, that, that level of control and influence. Thanks, Edgy. And we've got a related question. I'll, perhaps I might put it to, to Scott um, uh, asking, does the panel have any tips on how pension schemes can engage with their asset managers on ESG and climate change? I mean, Scott, any, any thoughts on that? What will be your sort of top tips for schemes on engaging with asset managers? Yeah, I think a, a top tip is just going back to the point about data. Get, get your hands on data. Get your hands on independent research to start um, to have a have a level playing field, and you know, referring back to Pat's example, um, small schemes can do can do this as well. If they have access to that data, they can have, you know, those direct conversations with their asset managers and better understand how, uh, and better monitor how the, their asset managers are incorporating um, ESG and climate related risks into um, their investment strategy. And um, I think. Once you have that data, once you have those reports, um, that gives you then a good platform to ask the asset managers, are they aware of those risks themselves and, and how are they planning to, to manage them going forward? Um, and I think those are, those are some good steps because within those reports, you can help, uh, they, they sort of help you identify red flags, uh, companies included in the portfolio that either um, uh, have breaches in relation to a set of principles um, or come up, uh, being involved in uh, controversial products as well that may or may not be a part of your um, investment exclusion policy as well. Thanks, Scott. And Caroline, I think you had a view on this. 
Yes, so I think I agree the data is important and making sure that you are, um, you have sort of that baseline of information and understanding. But it's also about thinking about the right questions to ask the second and third order questions and, and trustees generally as a whole are really good at having that robust dialogue and, and challenging their asset managers and figuring out when the asset manager story doesn't quite match up with some of the other stuff that you're, you're seeing in terms of what they're presenting to you and where some of the gaps might be. So it's thinking about um, being one step ahead of the asset manager. And there are loads of, in fact, PLSA tools um, that will help you with this, with, with digging down into not just getting the asset managers to talk about their successes or allowing them to cherry pick the case studies where they've got a really good story to tell, but actually asking them about, um, you know, what the processes and systems they are they have in place to do these kinds of things are they taking a thoughtful approach to it are they taking an approach that seems to be aligned with what you would like to see as a client and i recognize that there are differences here in terms of how you are invested with them, whether it's a pooled or segregated mandate as well um, and asking them where the challenges have been that they found and um, one of the the key questions that we really like to ask is about asset managers approach to managing their stewardship conflicts um, we think that sort of gives you a real insight into how thoughtful the stewardship approach of an asset manager has been quite often they'll come back with well this is our firm wide conflicts policy but that's what not that's not what you're looking for any asset manager worth their salt will be thinking about whether there are any barriers to them engaging voting in a really impartial way that actually gets to the nub of what a corporate governance or e or s issue at a company might be and it's also just about thinking about that the key points in the asset manager cycle where you can really achieve influence. So the due diligence and the manager selection process, make sure that you have a good eye on the RFPs and due diligence, um, that the questions that you would like to see answered are woven through. And you know you don't need, again, any huge level of understanding for that. There are templates already out there. And then thinking about manager review times as well. How do you make the most and how do you get your consultants to support you in making the most of these key opportunities to review and to challenge. And again, you know, I too can put in some links in the chat to various PLSA guides that I worked on um, with others, including the Investor well, I mean, Forum, whilst I was at the PLSA for people if they want to find out more. Yeah, thanks. I, I, I think that just, to, just to add to that, and I, I think just from having been sort of working with institutions for, for what are we getting on for almost 25 years now? I think one of the things that I would say, particularly to Scott's point about with more data available today, it very much does enable, particularly if you're an investment consultant or a fiduciary where you're aggregating portfolios together, um, you are in a much better position today, in my experience, to basically be able to provide and support trustees much more effectively than we have been historically. So to be able to provide a client um, on a regular basis, that full look through of their portfolio to break out segregated and pooled holdings and aggregate that information together and then pair that information against their views around ES and G risks, climate risks, et cetera, is a, has been, I think, for us working with institutional pension schemes, has been a material step forward in terms of enriching that dialogue. But the two points I'd sort of move on from that is that, first of all, to touch on something Caroline mentioned in terms of you, often you see it, you, you, the, the provider or the manager may have a, a sort of overarching policy, but very much if you're an investor or an institution, you're investing in a specific strategy or fund. So that's what you care about at the end of the day. And that's what you are expecting the narrative to very much explain what's going on there rather than your wider policy, because that's all good and well. But actually, if your fund that you're actually exposed to and this is coming through from implementation statements, et cetera, is doing something completely different or certainly not fully reflecting their broader house view. How do you challenge that? So that's very much where I've seen from a fiduciary standpoint, how that feeds through the research process, but how you then communicate that back to clients. I think the other point going back to something I said about looking forward, um, in very much is all good and well providing a snapshot of where you are today. So I can aggregate up 50 underlying managers into a single ESG page and snapshot around their climate exposure. But what I'm more interested in, I think what's more valuable to supplement the narrative is what's the direction of travel? What are you, are you, is the trend positive or negative? Is there momentum in terms of making positive progress against metrics? And that very much feeds where I see the TCFD guidance and disclosures applying to every, every institutional investor going forward. So again, how does the fiduciary help or how does the consultant help the client, help trustees 
explain that narrative, but also provide them information that is a useful call to action is key going forward from here. Yeah. Okay, thanks, Angie. And we've got a couple of questions come in, which I think I probably need to direct uh, to Pat, actually. Uh, they're just sort of short ones. One is a, a factual one. What was the name of the UN data that Pat mentioned to enable trustees of her scheme to have a conversation with the asset managers? Perhaps, Pat, you can quickly answer Yes, it was, it was the 10 UN compact principles that we screened um, our portfolios against. So okay. 10 industry um, principles laid out um by by the un so the the, the very, they cover basically everything on the esmg and climate Thanks change and another one i think it's referring back to the to the survey results uh, so why and it's from steve burgess why do 70 percent of funds think climate risks will have low to medium effect on investments do you want to try and shed light on that um was it i think it's lack of, i think i think we go back to the the lack of understanding of, of climate change risks and the impact to the pension scheme investments. There's, there's, I think, you know, I tried to, to allude to the fact we all know that, you know, the, the, the 20 hottest years have been in the last 22 years. And, you know, the Arctic ice is reducing by 40% in the last 40 years. I think we all know that. And we know the Australian bushfires, you know, are caused by climate change, et cetera, but we're not linking it directly to the pension scheme investments. Mm -hmm. We're not actually thinking about pension scheme investments when, you know, invested in companies and those risks will impact the performance of those companies, especially those ones that don't have a sustainable model in place. So I think, you know, I was quite surprised by that result, but I think it's that lack of linkage between the two. Yeah, great. Okay, now Richard Robertson's come back. I see Richard wasn't totally satisfied by the answers uh, that we gave earlier on directing investment because it didn't maybe quite get to, to, to the point. So he's come back and said, is developing policy on asset management a form of directing investment from which we're prescribed? I don't know if anyone's got a, got a comment on that, Aji, perhaps? I don't, I don't think setting out policy that underpins your beliefs and then passing that across to your providers to implement or execute so you can monitor that is, is directing. Uh, I think there is a difference to Richard's comment versus Ian's question around yeah. um, physically directing, I think, uh, and, and taking that step further on, that, which, which in, in that sense, there is a balance from a trustee perspective in terms of their, their ability to govern the decisions they're making and to, let's call it, support and back up the decisions they're making in terms of where they are today. Uh, again, I think there is a difference where you've got to I sort of go to Caroline in terms of the level of scale resource to sort of underpin their decision making and to direct what they're doing. And given they are a regulated entity versus, uh, let's call it a more typical or traditional trustee board, given their other priorities and other areas of governance focus. So I think there is a difference from there and you, you, you have to look at the, the, the spectrum of trustee board populations rather than uh, look at one area in isolation. Yeah. Okay, thanks, Sanji. Uh, and um, we've got a question here specifically for Caroline from a, an anonymous attendee. I'm not quite sure why uh, we've got an anonymous attendee, but anyway, our friend wants to know, Caroline, what have you found now you're in-house and how does it compare to the policy statements from your days at the PLSA? So, uh, so uh, policy statements from my days at the PLSA. So I don't think we ever sort of really produced policy statements as such. I suppose we issued views in terms of consultation responses. Um, it feels, it doesn't feel that dissimilar in terms of um, uh, being conscious and getting understanding of some of the pressures that are facing trustees and even large pension schemes with in-house dedicated resource. Um, you know, it, I think in terms of the, the impact, you do feel the impact of these different disclosures and the regulatory requirements and really thinking about what does net zero, for instance, look like um, a net zero commitment? Yes, but how does that um, spread across the portfolio and what does it mean for some of the other financial characteristics like, like liquidity risk and so on that, that you're really thinking about as well? Um, so it, it doesn't feel like a surprise. I wouldn't say it's necessarily changed my my views on anything, if that is what the question is trying to get at. Um, but it, 
you know, it is really interesting trying to take some of the pieces of work, I suppose, that we produced at the PLSA, like the voting guidelines, for instance, or the implementation statement guidance, and trying to, to work that through and apply it to a real life example. Okay, thanks, Colin. Now, and the clock is ticking around. We've only got four or five minutes left, amazingly. Uh, so I think we'd have to move to our last question. And I wanted to ask, and I'm going to bring Scott in first. So Scott, in, in wrapping all this up, you know, if you had one tip for our audience on ESG climate change governance, what would that be? Um, I think I've said it before, so it's a bit of repetition. Get your hands on data, get your hands on reports. Um, there's a lot of noise around ESG. Um, it's a hot topic, excuse the pun. Um, but, and in that, on that point, don't be afraid to ask the tough questions, you know, ask your asset managers on successes had on ESG initiatives taken on things like company engagement, um, fund performance and sort of risk management activities and, and tying into risk management, I think more education around the impact of climate change, transition risk, physical risk on portfolios is, is probably required. You know, referring back to that 70% thinking that climate change risks have a low to medium impact, I think you know, that, that's pretty clear that we need to potentially to, the, to wrap that up a bit more. And, and in, in all, through these reports and through this data, I hope that uh, asset owners can start to better understand how that sort of bo bottom up ESG analysis is fed into that sort of investment decision making process in the selection of, of, of um, companies within portfolios. And you know, making sure that that's in line with the scheme's investment principles and, and beliefs on ESG and climate change. Thanks, Scott. Uh, Ajit, anything you would add by way of a last top tip? Yeah, I, I think at the end of the day, too to early discussion, that there's a lot of uh, onus on trustees today um, to ensure they're providing the right disclosure, uh, reporting and monitoring metrics. Uh, my, my premise is, uh, particularly in the DB landscape, is, is almost a notion of start with the end in mind. Where are you trying to get to over the next 10 years, which is a reasonable time frame for many, many schemes? What risks are you facing along that way from an ESG, a climate investment? And particularly, which nobody really talks about is ESG and climate risk from an investment portfolio, but what about my covenant? Uh, and again, thinking about how that all fits together. And that's very much how you can then sit down and work with your provider, your consultant, fiduciary, what have you, to set a clear framework that allows you to monitor and measure progress as a call to action. Because I think it would just be, you've got, we've got to go beyond the tick box and have a clear call to action and a set of metrics, to Scott's point, using the data available so you can see I'm making progress and again, uh, move forward from there. Yeah, thanks. Caroline, last very quick top tip. Um, I think, uh, you know, don't be discouraged by um, by discussion of the barriers. There are so many um, resources out there that are telling you what the lay of the land is, like this, you know, really interesting survey. Get your hands dirty, start reading around, read the survey, pick up the phone to other trustees, pick up the phone yeah. to your peers, have those conversations. You are experts at challenging and probing on investment administration governance issues. And this is an investment and governance issue like any other get the basics don't be discouraged speak to others great well that's a great message i think to to, to wrap up on so uh, uh, thanks very much to all our contributors and panelists to, to to pat caroline to scott to angie great job uh, everyone thanks for taking all those questions giving some in such insightful answers uh just to all our attendees we have recorded this and we'll be circulating uh, a link to that i'm told that the results of the survey will also will be going round on an email that we'll be sending around tomorrow. Uh, so do look out uh, for that. Um, uh, there will also be a survey uh, for you to give feedback on this webinar. So do uh, answer that please. And for every completed survey, uh, the PLSA donates, <coughs> excuse me, five pounds to our supported charity, which is Friends of the Elderly. So further incentive. Uh, thanks very much for me to my excellent uh, colleagues, Anna and Louisa, who are the unseen hands behind the scenes who make all this sort of technology happen. Uh, great, great, great job to them. Thank you very much. Uh, and thanks again to Cassis for supporting this, uh, this event. You know, it's, it's great to have our partnership with them. So otherwise, thanks again to all our speakers. Thanks to everyone uh, at home or in the office, wherever you are for dialing in and enjoy the rest of the day. Goodbye. <laughs>